Hey guys, welcome back. It's me, Gimpy, and I'm here with a little more uh, Pendragon, The Fall of Roman Britain by GMT Games for you. This is the latest in their coin series. Uh, if you haven't watched my previous videos on uh, this series, go ahead and watch those so you'll understand where I'm at here and where I'm coming from. Uh, make sure especially that you watch part three because that's where I really get into uh, the battle system and go over the notes that I'd gotten from the designer on the battle system done correctly and the whole thing. And that's really where this game comes from. It's, it's all about the battle system because it is so much more conflict heavy uh, than previous games in the system. There's just massive amounts of pieces coming on the board, off the board, uh, back and forth. Uh, side switching control, fighting for little plots of land, and then little bits of entry going back and forth. Uh, now, when I started this set, I said I wasn't going to take and play through a whole game for you because they're just this game is so much, and especially I have found while playing it solitaire, there is it's got a good solitaire system. And as far as coin games go, being able to play it solitaire, I think Pendragon uh, does a good job for it. Uh, if you want a coin game to play solitaire, and you like high conflict ones this is a good game for you you can uh, definitely do that if you want less conflict I would probably look into the next one coming out in the series because it actually has a faction that has no combat capabilities I don't know specifically how that's gonna work just what I've read and heard about so far uh, definitely check that out if you're interested in one that's a little less conflicty you know badly as uh, this one is but in this video, I'm going to take and kind of touch up the last stuff that uh, I hadn't touched on previous videos. Basically, my thoughts of the game, you know, where I'm at now, what I've noticed and uh, experienced in my time with it, and then kind of cover the Epoch card and how that works. Um, I wanted to at least show all the aspects of the game, and the, the Epoch was the main thing that I had not covered up until this point. So once I get done kind of touching on a few basics of it, I'll uh, hit the Epoch because I played the, from the last video, I played a couple of cards more through off camera just because it would have taken me another three videos at least uh, to play through those cards. It just, especially if you're filming it, which is going to add time, there's a lot of fiddly stuff back and forth. Not necessarily bad fiddly stuff, but when you're playing solitaire, there's a lot to keep track of. You're not just thinking of your own faction and then just kind of walking down the list as far as the other factions are concerned. You really have to do, you know, put thought into what they're doing and then what you're doing in response to what they're doing and then making sure you're keeping track of all the minutiae. So it does take a little while uh, to play through. I have found that while you're playing the game, like I said, solitaire, that it can be played solitaire it's fun solitaire I find for me I enjoyed the raider factions because I'm not as worried about uh, losing my troops because if I want I can just raid again on the next turn and roll the dice and uh, see how many I get and you just kind of keep plinking away at a certain area like you can see I'm playing the uh, the black faction the Saxons I got a nice little clump here and then I got a couple of clumps way over here where I had uh, was able to take out a couple more forts and uh, they had lost control over here, and I'm still not going to try to pronounce these names. I have looked in the back of the playbook and gone over that, and they had lost the control here, but in response to that, the Ducks faction, the Roman faction, had moved in a large uh, contingent of cavalry here, and they're going to take out my raiders. But due to the timing of the game, they're actually not going to be able to take out my raiders because the next card ended up being the Epoch card, uh, which is going to take and switch over all that stuff. And you'll see here in a sec that my guys are going to get returned. There's not going to be any combat. They were set up to do a lot of combat against me, though. And this is where I was wanting to set up a, a settlement. So that kind of threw me off. You can see over here along the edge, the Scotty faction had gotten a bonus to where they got extra raiders uh, when they were invading along that coastline. So they had done a lot of braiding there and then got a deep braid over in here and you can see that they did a excellent job wiping that out but again the red faction the ducks moved in some of their troops and they're getting ready to take out those raiders but again we're getting ready to hit the epoch phase the epoch pretty much kind of resets the board it puts a lot of plunder back on the board 
uh, moves troops back to kind of their home areas. Raiders come back. Um, Fodorati have to be paid for. The uh, the black or the green that are working for the blue or the red have to be paid for, or they go back to their own side. There's there's a lot that goes on during that period of time. I did want to touch on though, as far as solitary play is concerned, I found something that worked for me a little better uh, than the way I was playing it previously. Because they have these, right? It's a player aid that gives you kind of walkthrough of what the AI faction is going to do, right? And you start up here and you kind of work your way down and it tells you whether or not it's doing an event or this, that, or the other. I found for me it worked easier to try to just kind of follow this until I got to right about here, whatever command they were going to do. If they were going to do, you know, for example, the, the blue guys, uh, battle, march, muster, or trade. Once I got kind of there, I kind of stopped using this and just played out the faction as if I was playing it myself. Basically, I used this to determine what command, what they were going to do, whether it was going to be the event or what command slash or feet, uh, feet they're going to use, and then just played it and picked where they were going to put it rather than getting into the minutia of this where it's like if a then b then you know one then two and sub minus this i found that just worked a lot easier for me and maybe that's kind of my playthroughs and locking the tactical kind of how i use their cards to do uh something similar that i would kind of get the idea of what the opposing side was going to do and then just kind of play it out as best that can be done i found that worked for me and saved a lot more time versus trying to get down to the very specific well there's just a touch more plunder at this spot than this spot and then well it was so much easier just to say okay well these are the least offended most plunder spots these are the places i think the scotty can do the best and the scotty are going to raid so they're going to hit here 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 and here and just be done with it if you want it to play a little faster i would suggest doing that it takes out a little bit of the um the grind, I guess is a way to put it, of trying to run the AI if you kind of do it half and half to where you let the worksheet walk you through to the generals of what they're going to do. They're going to, hey, the, <laughs> I still messed this up. Yeah, I think it looked, uh, I looked at the, the pronunciations. I think these are pronounced Kiwi Tots, Kiwi Tots, something like that. Um, or Kiwi Tates. Oh, it was back in the playbook. I looked over them, but there's no way I'm going to remember. Uh, okay, if they decide to battle, okay, I just stopped it. Hey, battle. And then looked at the board to figure out what the best battle was for them instead of getting down into all that. Now, that's just me. You don't have to play it that way. That's not the way you're supposed to if you're doing it the AI. But for me, I found it worked better. Just, uh, you know, take it or leave it. Do what you want, you know. But that's uh, how I found it to be the easier way to, to play the game uh, when it came down to the specifics. Now again, when it comes down to the battle system of the game itself, it's very in-depth. Like I've said previously, there's just so much. I would definitely recommend taking and printing off these extra player aids, the battle board. All of this, by the way, you can get on BGG, uh, BoardGameGeek.com under the uh, file section. Um, there's a couple of that give you the uh, results for assaulting a stronghold, you know, how many troops you're going to need, depending on how many withdrawn troops there are, uh, probability of, you know, your raid succeeding versus, you know, what type of uh, settlements. And here's a little neat one that I found that uh, just gives you the quicks of uh, ambush, evade uh, type rolls and what you're going to need to roll and what type of location for uh, Saxon Scotty Raiders. And, uh, your kiwi tots down there at the bottom it just makes it a little bit easier but the battle system is so in depth there are so many little steps that you have to keep track of and the fact that certain strengths certain combat values are getting halved at some points not halved at other points and what uh time frame certain guys are hitting and then well if they roll right then they might hit at a different time they may hit earlier you know like the the raiders can end up hitting an ambush instead of down here in harass so they'll hit up here with the cavalry instead and here in melee is when 
um, your militia and some of the others hit. So, you know, raiders normally are last, but they can be close to first. There's just a lot to keep track of. And that's what I was talking about, being a little fiddly when it comes to it. Just make sure you print these out. Print out the player aids. And, and like I said, it's not a bad thing. I'm not hating on it. I enjoy the extra conflict that this game brings uh, to it because there's a lot of thought to it. Like, what areas can I take? How much uh, forces can my enemy bear against me? And I, I like the Raider. I like the theme of it. I like the, the time frame that it's set in. So for me, it works. But this might not be the coin game for you. It's definitely not a beginner's coin game. I mean, if you're a beginner to coin, you can pick it up. You can learn anything. I mean, hell, I could learn a war, a war if I wanted to, but doesn't mean that it's going to be the easiest if it's the first game I pick up. It's definitely not the easiest of the coin series, but it's not horribly difficult uh, if you, you know, just take your time with it. And like I said, read the playbook. That was my biggest mistake uh, when it came to this game, was I read the rule book and I thought, well, I've played coin games before and I've read the rule book now. I'm good. The playbook really did explain a lot of the stuff that I was missing when it came to the game. Uh, and it said it in like a plainer language. The, the rule books I find sometimes can be written in like a legally sounding term. And the playbook put it in like I was talking to someone and having the game just kind of explained to me and that was so much easier and I wish I had done that before I had actually started filming it would have improved the the quality of my first couple of videos on this game but at least you guys were able to see some of the mistakes that you could be making and you know my corrections on them so let's take and now walk through the uh, epoch phase and let you guys see how that's going to run in your game and at that point I'll pretty much have covered the the basics of the game I mean you'll still have you know, little scenarios that could pop up, but you'll understand the basics and whether or not Pendragon is for you. All right, I will take and throw up on screen, I'm trying to make sure I'm staying in my lighting here, um, the card here, the Epoch card. It's card 79, what is this? Rescript, rescript of Honoris? Honoris? Something like that. I don't know. Um, basically, you're going to have so many early epoch cards i think it's it's three or four early or three or four late i forget which there's seven uh epoch, uh epoch cards in total you know roughly half of each if you set up your game for a long game six epochs then you're going to have these spread roughly equidistant throughout your decks or your deck rather and every so often it's something like 12 cards depending on where it gets uh, shuffled into your deck is when you're going to draw one of these and similar to others when you draw this it doesn't replace the card that you have out they switch places so you know how you can see the card that's coming when you flip this over and you see the epoch is the card that's there that way you don't uh, have time to plan for the epoch phase basically when it flips over it takes the place of the card that's supposed to be placed uh, taking place that turn you run through your epoch and then the card that was going to happen happens the round afterwards and the game's back to a kind of a reset uh, state at that point. Now there is a good player aid with the game for the epoch phase. All right, your epoch round, it's on the back side or front side, depending on how you're looking at it, of the battle sheet that comes with it, the battle sheet player aid. So you're just gonna start here on your left side, work all the way down and then all the way down. There's a lot of stuff to kind of keep track of, but it's not hard if we just take and go easy with it. Let's take, and this is your little epoch marker and your epoch rounds. And this is just to help remind you of where you're at and keep track of it. Cause sometimes you might stop and have to kind of fiddle with a lot of stuff on the board just so you can keep track of uh, where you're at. So first thing that we're gonna do is the Anana. And no, no. <laughs> it's this, we're paying our Fodorati troops, all right? The guys that have uh, their Saxon or uh, Scotty that are being paid by whichever faction, the blue or the red, to fight for them, you have to pay for those troops. Now, the way it says to do this is to take and put plunder cubes on them. Uh, that way you annotate which ones have been paid for or not. But if you're paying for all of them across the board, 
and you don't have to worry about it, you can just transfer those funds directly to uh, whichever faction. So for example, if we look here, there are three red Fodorati's, and since we are still at, we're on our Imperium track up here, it's still Roman rule, it's top left, it's the most Roman that it can be. It's not at fragmentation, so the uh, Ducks, the Roman faction, is not having to pay these out of their own wealth. They're still paying for them out of uh, blue wealth, Britain wealth, basically. So, three of those, you pay one to one. We're at 23, we'll come down to 20. And that means the Saxon faction, since these are black, get three money. So they're at four, they'll go up to seven. And I'll drop it right there. So that is the only Fodorati's I have on the board. Basically, you're gonna pay for them one to one uh, on your resources, uh, your blue resources. Let me tilt that just a little bit so you can see over there. there. The board's so big, I'm trying to make sure I've got as much of the pertinent information on uh, camera as I can get. But you're gonna pay those one to one and whatever faction they belong to get that in renown. And it's gonna tell you here on that. The um, That's why they kind of tell you to <clears throat> stack the plunder cubes on them. That way you can kind of count up how many plunder cubes that faction is gonna get. And they're gonna get, uh, you know, Scotty or Saxon are gonna get that much renown, which is their resources after those troops have been paid for. And you only have to worry about putting the plunder cubes on if not all of them are gonna get paid. All right, uh, da -da. and released warbands plunder their regions, prosperity up to population. So if these guys had not been paid for, so I got three here and the population of Iceni is two, they would take the two plunder from here and put them on them and then they would end up receiving that. Basically, if you don't pay them, they'll attack the area they're in and ransack it which is what that's supposed to represent, <clears throat> while also switching back to the Saxon faction. So it definitely behooves the blue and the red players to pay those guys, you know, if they can. And reading through the playbook and some other stuff I've seen on the game, part of this is the blue and the red faction, like the reds trying to uh, keep dominance over everything, including the blue faction to not let them fragment away, you know, keep them under Roman control. And part of the way they can do that is spending down the resources of, like just the regular resources, because you've got, for the blue faction, you've got resources and then you have wealth, which is separate. The red faction doesn't have access to the blue's wealth, all right? So the blue's trying to stock up wealth that they can take and use towards their victory condition. But if the red spends down the resources, and the blue faction has blue Fodorati's they need to pay, well, they're gonna to have to spend their wealth to pay those Fodorati's, which is taking their power away and puts it more back in the hands of the red faction, the Romans. And that's just, that's one of those neat aspects of the game that I really like is the blue and the red faction are technically working together, but they have to work against each other enough to make sure neither one of them gain enough power over the other but while still working together enough to make sure they're not losing to the green and the, the black factions as well. that That's the absolute neatest part of the game to me, is the internal politics. And why I think this would do great as a four-player game, where everyone's you know pushing for their own agenda, and you're trying to you know work with that guy across from you. You know, blue guy's trying to work with the red guy just enough to keep them you know, together and keep what they want while still trying to sock away their resources and the red is trying not to lose their foothold which means they need to keep control and they need to keep the blue you know up but without letting blue get too far ahead because then they can take and break away and fragment and become their own faction and that's just it's really neat to me that that goes on okay so after we take care of that phase we go to the imperium phase all right that is dealing with this Imperium track here. So let's take and slide our Epoch marker over. Hoarding. The Kiwi Tots may transfer Britain resources up to half rounded up. And make sure you're paying attention on this thing because there's times where you're rounding up and times where you're rounding down and you have to make sure you keep track of which is which. 
All right. Uh, may transfer Britain resources up to half, rounded up, the number of towns or hill forts after uh, the pivotal event is played for the blue faction to wealth, one for one. Okay, so they can take, and this is another reason why the red will want to take and sometimes spend down those blue resources if they're able to keep the blue from being able to hoard those resources as wealth because again that wealth is a victory condition for the blue faction now over here on the left side of the board you can see right along here it's got the uh the towns and there's numbers here listed down so you can see just by looking at the board instantly how many towns are on the board so you don't have to count them up i can see there's 12 towns here bam i don't have to worry about counting how many are there let's pin this back just a little bit so since they can hoard half the number of towns rounded up we don't have to round half of 12 is six they can transfer six resources one to one into wealth so they're definitely going to do that 20 let's see that's going to go down to 14 and they had 10 so that's going to go up to 16 okay and again, in the rule book and playbook, it goes over what the uh, AI factions are going to do during the Epoch faction or during the Epoch phase, like, you know, how they're going to handle things. But for the most part, they're always going to pay for Fodorati. Their blue factions are always going to try to stock up wealth, things like that. So at this point, I just kind of play it like I would play it if I were playing those factions uh, to save time rather than trying to dig through what they're going to do on the exact thing you know now this is where we're determining whether or not that is going to move the imperium track is going to move the blue faction wants to get it into blue the red faction wants to keep it up and to the left while the blue faction is trying to drag it down <clears throat> if britain control is 21 to 30 or total prosperity plus prestige is 31 to 55 shift any Roman rule to autonomy, same dominance. <clears throat> Roman rule is up here and, and autonomy is down here. So basically Roman rule, they would be losing control over Britain at that point. Unfortunately for the blue faction and the game that I'm playing, they are at 31 control. So they have one control too many to um, drop it down which they would actually want because they're going to get taxed very heavily uh, here later when they're going over their income because it's still into this Roman rule. So unfortunately that doesn't work for them. So we don't have to worry about that. If Britain control is less than or equal to 20, it goes down to fragmentation. We're not there yet. Uh, if any shift occurred down from Roman rule or autonomy, divide prestige and wealth by two. Uh, prestige and is just the Roman prestige not the prestige plus posterity marker that you've got the uh, I'll put it on the screen for you I should have a thing for it but just a little one right here ducks prestige so you would divide that in half <clears throat> and you would divide the wealth in half but again we don't have to worry about that because we're not at either one of those where are we at? if wealth minus or is if wealth is greater than prestige where are we at by 10 okay let me make sure i'm reading this exactly right okay so this works out for our blue faction if wealth exceeds prestige by at least 10 you know greater than uh equal to 10 then you're going to shift military dominance to civilian not if at fragmentation. So since wealth is at 16 right now, it's way up there in the top of the corner, and prestige is at zero due to things that happened during the game, wealth is great. Uh, wealth would not be that high normally in the game. The Kiwitas faction got a event card that gave them 10 wealth during this game that I was playing here and really kind of bumped them up. So. They're doing great as far as that's concerned. So we will switch this over to civilian dominance instead of uh, military dominance, which is not good for the red player, but good for the blue player. All right, and it has to do with switching it back over if prestige is greater, but 
uh, you'll check for victory conditions. You can see your victory conditions, by the way, on the bottom of your player aid that lists down your uh, actions and feats that you can do. At the bottom, it shows your a little summary of the victory conditions for each one of the factions down here so that's a good place for you to look like the kiwi Tots faction needs 36 uh, at roman rule 27 at their control 27 at autonomy 16 at fragmentation and some dominance things like that so they don't have that right now it wouldn't matter anyway we're playing six epochs or this one this game is six epochs uh saxon control exceeds 10 and that's the control of the population that they have right now. Right now, on my board, there's just a bunch of uncontrolled areas and Britain control. None of the um, Saxon or Scotty factions have been able to establish a foothold yet, but we'll see if that's going to happen. So, no victory condition, nothing to worry about that. And now we resolve the Epoch event. Our Epoch event is, I'll put the card on the screen. Uh, if under Roman rule, which we are, shift any military dominance to civilian dominance, or if already there, to autonomy with military dominance. Ooh, that's good for these guys. So we're actually going down again. Bam. Um, then Ducks pays zero more resources. Uh, Kiwi Tots may add from wealth. They may. They don't have to. Roll 1d6 per seven cavalry on the map. Uh, round up, ducks removes cavalry uh, to available equal to rolled total less amount paid. Okay, so this is a mouthful, but basically for every resource paid, you can take and, um, let's see, how many cavalry they got on the map? They have, I think it's 20 cavalry total. They've got 19 on the map, so they'd have to roll 3d6, and they can subtract whatever resources they put towards it. And I'll tell you what, the ducks are going to take and put all the resources towards it. That's 14, because they're getting ready to get paid anyway. And uh, since we're at autonomy, I'm going to go with the blue faction is not going to contribute their wealth. They want to hold on to it. So basically, I roll 3d6. And then I subtract 14 from it and see what happens. The ducks has to remove cavalry uh, to available, not to uh, uh, casualties or anything like that, equal to the roll total less the amount paid. So this is my event, and it would be different for you guys, depending on what you guys do. Let's see, or what card you draw, rather. Let's see if I'll just throw this right here so you guys can see it. We got three D6s that came with the game here. And we'll roll it and see what number it has. As long as it's below um, 14, it's not gonna matter. Yeah, came up to 12, so no biggie. They paid all their resources and did not lose any of their cavalry to the uh, available box. Oh, whooping my camera. It actually sucked. Uh, in between shots, the, the third video I did and this fourth one, I actually bumped the side of the table and I had to redo the whole damn board from the video. Uh, at least I had that, though. I mean, since I'm filming my games, uh, if I do bump the board, I've got something to go off of to reset it. All right, so after we've resolved our Epoch event, now we get into revenue, you know, the money. Ducks only if military dominance, which they are, increase prestige by four five under roman rule two if on autonomy so they're under autonomy right now they'll go up to two on prestige um only under fragmentation we're not at that kiwi tots add britain resources equal to prosperity under britain control plus towns all right and let's see our total prosperity we're keeping track of it here is at 64 and towns is 12 so that goes up to 74 and the good part for them is they don't have any taxes the next thing on there is imperial taxes under Roman only under Roman rule so if they hadn't gotten bumped down to here they would have been losing a lot of resources into taxation 
but they're actually not right now. So they're getting 74 resources that just get added up. So that's going to bump them up quite a bit. All right, and Saxons add Saxon renown equal to prosperity under Saxon control. There is none. Same for the Scotty. There is none. <clears throat> Upkeep adjust control as needed. Um, the ducks convert all plunder carried by ducks to ducks resources one for one. Basically, that means any troops on the board that have little gold cubes on them are going to take and turn those in. The ducks doesn't have any. Each fort either pay one resource or remove it to available. See, they've got 10 forts. They're gonna pay 10 resources. And that's gonna go down to 64. Um, if, at, if under autonomy, either pay 10, let me make sure I'm getting it there. Pay, either pay 10 resources to maintain roads or set permanently to not maintained. They're gonna pay the 10. You can see how these resources go quick. Oh, I dropped my little thing. Hold on, let me grab it. Alright, so we'll take and put that there because they're going to maintain the roads and relocate all cavalry and if desired uh, to and if desired among forts. If any forts remain on the map, then relocate all red Fodorati to red Fodorati settlements of their barbarian nation or if none, remove all red Fodorati markers of that nation so basically you have to bring your troops back to their home bases um, they had actually just pushed out they had pushed out a lot of troops here and all around here because they were going to go after all these different raiders but now they're not so they're going to take and go back there this guy's going to go back here this guy's going to go back here this guy's going to go back here and these red photorati that i have over here are going to go to the only red Fodorati settlement that's there so they're good oh i forgot to take earlier when i um did that those red guys pay them their resources i don't know maybe i do that later but i want to make sure i don't forget it uh da -da -da -da. put cavalry casualties into available per imperium track round down all right so there's one casualty then remaining casualties are in out of play all right, there's one casualty right now, and it's actually listed right here on the board. One half casualties, two available. Britain, cooperation, roads maintained. Okay, and this is, is it round down? Yeah, it's round down. So if you're putting casualties into available and it's one half of casualties into available, rounded down with the rest out of play, with only one being there, it's going into out of play because you divide that number in half comes to a half round down out of play if there had been two there instead of just one one would have gone into the box for available for following turns and one would have gone to out of play so you can see why it behooves the red side to take and keep themselves as powerful as possible so their troops keep coming back all right so now we've taken care of the ducks faction kiwi tots Convert all plunder, same thing. Any of the blue guys that are carrying plunder <clears throat> are going to take and convert that into resources. They don't have any right now. Each space remove one in three militia rounded down to the available. So since it's rounded down, if you have less than three militia, which are the light blue pieces, <clears throat> you don't have to remove any. So all these spaces over here with one or two militia, nothing to worry about. This one space up here has four though, so it's going to lose one of its militia. Down there, and make sure I'm not missing any other spaces. Yeah, the, the blue militia have taken a beating uh, during this game. Every three comatots, there's none on the board right now. Either pay one wealth or remove them to available. So for every three dark blue that you have on the board, you've got to pay wealth, not uh, resources, wealth to cover those guys. Uh, discard half roundup of all available refugee markers you get refugees when the population of an area changes like it's reduced uh, due to raiding or attacks or something like that uh, none of that's happened yet and you would use these little markers to take and show the change in the population so it can go up it can go down 
uh, just depending on what's going on during the turn. Let's see, where were we? Relocate all militia and comitats from spaces without town or hill fort to nearest town or hill fort and relocate the blue Fodorati to their nation. So basically your troops have to be somewhere where they've got a settlement. And I think all the blue guys are at this point because the ones that weren't got killed by raiders. Yep, okay, so those guys are all near some of their places. Uh, Saxons and then Scotty, they're each gonna do the same thing. Each space with that faction's plunder return. And this is the part that kinda hit me because I was like, no, when the, uh, the Epoch card came up because I really wanted to try to get a settlement on the board, but all my raiders are getting returned at this point. I do get the plunder that they have on them though. So, let's see, there's two plunder cubes and there's another four over here and another one over here. So what is that? That's seven cubes that were on my raiders. So I get seven more resources, bump that up to 17, and then all the raiders come back. They essentially do a return uh, command and are brought back. The Scotty are gonna do the same thing. <clears throat> Make sure I'm not missing anything else in there. Uh, okay, we'll cover that in just a sec. You also have to relocate any warband. Your raiders come back, but your warbands can stay on the board. Any warbands that are not Fodorati would have to go back to one of your settlements. And if you didn't have a settlement, then it'd have to be removed to available. So the Scotty are getting, ooh, they're getting a lot of resources. That's two, is that four, six, and eight. So they got a lot. They, uh, they were doing real good as far as that's concerned. They took out a lot of the hill forts that were along this side of the board in a previous turn. So we'll move all those guys over. All right, so they're gone. They got their resources. And where are we at? Uh, new leadership. If Saxon Renown is below 10, set it to 10. If Scotty Renown is below 6, set it to 6. They're both doing real good. You can see right at the top of the screen. They're at, uh, was at 17 and 12, so they're doing good. Now, each region with any control, all right, any control, it has to have Britain control, Ducks control, Saxon control, doesn't matter, but as long as it has control, we'll take and recover. Sorry, my phone just went off. We'll recover prosperity, the gold cubes, equal to population. You're first gonna add to the bottom roll, row, and then only under Roman rule. So if you're at autonomy or fragmentation, you will not add to the top row, okay? So you will first uh, add to the bottom, and if at Roman rule, add to the top. No row holds more prosperity than the space's population. So if a space goes up in population, it can hold more prosperity. You know, that's signifying the town's bigger, more people putting out goods and services. But if it's been raided a lot and lost population, then it's not gonna take and go up. So all these areas over here that have no control marker, they gain nothing. Anything else on the board, and since I'm at autonomy, I can't go above uh, that bottom row. So let's see, I don't think I'm gaining anything anywhere because this over here, I can't put one in the top row. I can't put anything in the top row. And there's a lot of these that don't have control yet. Try to make sure, yeah. The ones that could take cubes are either, like see, no control. If this was controlled here, this space, it would gain two cubes. But since it's not under control, nothing. And, oh, good God, if, it's, if it had stayed into Roman rule, there would be so many more gold cubes on the board than there are right now. Because all these other areas, here, here, over here, there, they would all add cubes into those top rows. But as it is, none of my spaces are getting um, any gold cubes. Wow, prosperity is going down. All right, uh, da, da, da. remove any excess. Each city with any control restores full prosperity. 
and none of the both cities here are still full there hasn't been any rating in those now reset discard all momentum events all factions to eligible and play the next card so we'll take and slide these guys over they're ready to go and some of the other cards that i have sitting over here like here's one for example that is until the end of an epoch will take and go away there are some cards that give abilities like this one i'll put it on the board for you number 18 that uh scotty's will get the uh, plus one extra raider in any space from ocean hibernicus that stays it does not say until the end of the epoch it's got that little symbol for um, uh, an ability so that sticks around and now we're done we've got uh the epoch phase completed like i said you just start here at the top and you work uh work your way down go through every little bit make sure you're staying focused on where you're at on the imperium track because that matters and then you're good you're going to take and just draw up that next card that you would have had when you switched out your epoch card and play it as normal with all the factions eligible so it'll be there along the top on who's going to go at what point and there we go that's how you play uh pen dragon hope you guys uh found the videos informative i gotta say i enjoy pen dragon i've seen some people who have um had differing opinions on it and i think this is one of the ones that you either really like it or you really hate it and that has just to do with i think uh like i said the amount of conflict that is in this game there is a lot of back and forth that's going to happen uh especially through war you know all the raiding that's going on uh you'll barely start to get built up and then all of a sudden you'll get hit with a big raid again and it'll just start wearing on you if you like that if you like that back and forth tug uh tug of war the whole time during a game oh and i was forgetting to move this uh along when i was doing the epoch but make sure you keep track of it if you like that you're gonna like this game i enjoy it i love like i said the time period i like how the raids are handled in this game especially the the biggest plus for me on this game is the way the factions interact with each other <clears throat> the fact that the blue and the red are supposed to kind of work together but then they're kind of working against each other as well and then the green and the black are not necessarily working together but they're not really working against each other either they're both raiding they don't have to go after each other but they can go after each other it's just it's really neat the intricacies of it and especially if you get into a four player game i think or even solitaire i've enjoyed the hell out of it uh the game does play well solitaire the solitaire system works like i said it's a little intricate it's not bad but it does get into the nitty-gritty of what to do in xy situation and i think it's easier to just take and figure out what the generalized order is going to be on a turn and then just kind of play it out from there as if you were playing that faction it just makes the game run smoother in my opinion but some people want a true solo experience which this one can give you because they do have the ai written out there for you anyway i'm going to end that here i hope you guys enjoyed it if you have any questions uh feel free to let me know i'm probably going to take and play a couple more cards on this just to have fun with it before i pack it up and put something on the table something else on the table to film for you guys because i have a bunch of other stuff i need to show you guys so if you have any questions let me know real quick and i'll try to cover them before i get this switched out for something else you guys take care i'll see you in the next one